Bonjour tout le monde, il y a déjà quelques mois de cela, nous avons diffusé un entretien que j'ai eu avec Lawrence Cross, un physicien américain, il est ici, euh, en direct depuis l'Oregon euh, à l'époque, euh, parce que c'était quelqu'un qui a beaucoup œuvré à la vulgarisation, donc on a parlé de science avec lui, on a parlé de culture scientifique, de l'importance de la culture scientifique dans la démocratie, on a parlé de, de vulgarisation, de cosmologie, puisque c'est sa spécialité. On a parlé de téléportation, un tout petit peu. On a parlé de croyance et, euh, et, et de pourquoi est-ce que lui euh, écrit euh, des livres grand public sur la science. Et depuis cet entretien est sorti en français le livre qu'il avait écrit euh, sur le euh, climat, « Comprendre le changement climatique ». La physique du réchauffement planétaire, une traduction d'Olivier Bosso aux éditions HEO, un livre euh, qui est vachement bien et un livre en plus qui est vachement beau, la maquette est, est très belle et vous avez des graphes en couleur, vous avez euh, des, plein de graphes qui illustrent plein de choses, des schémas, des cartes, euh, des. Euh, et donc voilà, c'est vraiment extrêmement euh, agréable à suivre et on comprend tout. Euh, je, je... Peut-être que je, enfin, peut peut je m'abuse en pensant que j'ai tout compris. En tout cas, c'est fort intéressant. Et je vais vous lire juste une phrase de l'introduction qui illustre la, la, la philosophie de, de l'auteur dans, dans cette démarche-là. Pourquoi est-ce qu'il a écrit ce livre euh, Il écrit, c'est la page 14, « La science sur laquelle s'appuie le changement climatique est accessible et intéressante. Et c'est sur elle que devraient s'établir les arguments et les discussions politiques. » Faire uniquement appel à l'émotion ou recourir à des logiques de peur ne devrait pas être le moyen d'encourager l'action. De même que l'inaction ne devrait pas être justifiée ou confortée par un déni des preuves et de la science sous-jacente du changement climatique. Au changement climatique, pardon. Voilà, euh, donc pour en, en, en savoir plus, eh ben, je vous laisse avec Lawrence Cross qui vous parle de ce livre, de pourquoi il l'a écrit. C'est en anglais, mais il y a des sous-titres dont vous allez comprendre. Et euh, j'espère que vous aurez envie de vous intéresser à ce sujet qui malheureusement va s'inviter de plus en plus dans nos vies quotidiennes puisque c'est un problème dont on ne va pas se débarrasser comme ça. Alors euh, essayons de le comprendre euh, si on veut le vivre le moins mal possible. Voilà. Et merci encore à Olivier qui nous a mis en contact avec euh, Monsieur Cross euh, et qui fait un travail génial. Voilà. Euh, à vous les studios. Dear uh, Lawrence Krauss, you are the author of a book about climate change, uh, which in French is called Comprendre le changement climatique, which is uh, uh, tr um, translated by Olivier, which is a friend of mine. Uh, thanks to him, we have this interview. Um, so why would we listen to a specialist of, in astrophysics on the issue of climate? Isn't it strange? It's strange, but I think it makes it Uh, it makes it in some sense more more reasonable. I think people who who are intimidated by the the, the, the debate what the, they view as the debate in public, the popular debate about about climate change uh, often worry about the vested interests of experts or the jargon of experts. But I think the most important thing is that I wrote a book about climate change because everyone, almost everyone who's for whom climate change is going to be relevant, isn't a climate scientist. And so if I, as a, as a scientist, can't understand enough to really understand the basic science, then how could anyone do that? And so I think it's important for me as a non-climate scientist to be able to translate uh, and, 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 and explore in my own way what the fundamental uh, basis of climate science is. And as I like to say, it's not rocket science. And as and I know that having written a book about imaginary rocket science, the physics of Star Trek, that's one of the reasons the title of this book is called The Physics of Climate Change in English, because it is really based on really fundamental ideas that anyone can appreciate. And anytime that's the case, it's appropriate for someone like me as a scientist to write about it. You don't have to be an expert. On the other hand, I, I'm able to learn and, and talk to experts enough. And And, and the other thing is that the history of this is quite fascinating as well. And so I think what I wanted to do was write a book that would be not intimidating and accessible for everyone to, so that they could realize that they could understand the basic issues that will be important to them as they look at the policies of the 21st century. And, um, 
And at the same time, it was very important to me to not get involved in the political questions. Hmm. I'm not a politician either, but I can talk about science policy. But I think if I'm putting on my scientific hat, what I can best do is inform people about the science. And anytime I talk about policy, that my discussions about policy may be informed by, by scientific knowledge, but they don't, but, but, but I don't have a special um, uh, uh, hat to wear in that regard. So, so in, in any case, the fact that I'm not a climate scientist, I hope will make this book more attractive for people rather than less attractive. You know, I'm sure you know that explaining models, giving facts is not sufficient to convince people. So what do you do when we know that? Well, I know, look, the only way people can understand things is to, is to have, or if they have misconceptions, is to have their mis is confront their misconceptions themselves. So in this book, as in my other books, I give some basic physics examples that are both fascinating mm -hmm. and, some, and sometimes surprising and sometimes non-intuitive. So that you go, oh, wow, I didn't understand that. Oh, oh that's neat. Um, and, and in fact, I begin in the book with something which may seem completely irrelevant, which is the fact that in some place in the world, there's only one tide instead of two, like, like, like Isaac Newton talked about. And that surprised me so much that I spent a week trying to figure out why that was the case. And why was I describing that? Because I was visiting the Mekong Delta in Vietnam, which happens to have only one tide a lot of the time. But importantly, that will be very important for climate change. I was visiting it because it's going to be one of the areas that most, most strongly hit and most quickly by climate change. So I'm not telling people what to think. I never try and do that. Mm -hmm. What I try and do is give people a chance to think and to, and to learn and understand the ideas. And then they can decide themselves what predictions are most reasonable and what aren't most aren't. But the other thing that's important is a lot of people think of climate change as a series of models about the future. And the models are so complicated. They're detailed computer models that we don't know whether we can believe them or not. What I try and show is that to get the basic predictions, you don't need any computer. That you can that fundamental physics comes very very close, and it's a, it's true not just for climate science. It's true for the universe. I always love to explain how simple ideas are very very powerful and come very very close to allowing us to understand the real the real heart of most of most phenomena in the world. And it's true for climate science as well. But the other thing that's important is that climate change isn't a prediction for the future. It's happening now. We can measure it now in ways that are totally, if you wish, not biased. For example, people talk about global warming and some people say, well, the, you know, it's not, the earth isn't heating up or the heat is for this or that. But what we can show is I don't care if that if, there are other impacts of human generated carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that are relevant, like the acidity of the oceans. That just comes from the dissolving of carbon dioxide in the oceans and, and the development of carbon, carbonic acid. And we can measure it and it's really happening. <clears throat> it's, not, it's unambiguous. Also, sea level rise, people may say, well, the glaciers aren't melting and you know, it's, it's it was a cold day today and wherever I am. Mm -hmm. and, and the point is, one of the most important things that is perhaps surprising to people, I think, is that sea level is rising, not be, right now because, the, 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 because ice is melting, But for a simple fact, the expansion coefficient of water, in the past 50 years, we've dumped heat into the oceans, and there's nothing we can do to stop the fact that, ocean, that the oceans are expanding because water expands from the heat. And, and a half a meter of, 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 um, of ex ocean expansion is just due to that. Forget the melting of glaciers. And, um, and there are other facts, I think, that are kind of neat. Some that are old, one I discovered from the 1850s, When they were first, when uh, first thinking about whether human uh, generated uh, carbon dioxide could be relevant to the climate, and 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 you know, given given the vastness of the Earth and the tininess of humans, you might you might wonder it's, whether it's impossible. And 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 a, and a Swedish geoscientist uh, uh, argued, pointed out in the 1850s, I think that. If you took all the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere before humans, just all of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and 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 solidified it in carbon, like the kind that we have in fuel, and ask, take all the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, how thick a layer of carbon would it produce on the Earth? And the the answer is about a millimeter, about a millimeter thick. And so when we think about how we're digging up oil and everything else, we can see that 
well, maybe human human generated industrial activity can generate things that are equivalent to everything that existed in the atmosphere before. Um, there's another example that I'll give you now that I don't use in the book, but I'll talk about in lectures, which I which I got from a friend of mine, um, Martin Reese, that people may say, well, carbon is only one ten thousandth or, 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 or of the or a few ten thousandths of the of the atmosphere. How can something carbon dioxide, which is such a small percentage of the atmosphere, have an impact globally on that on the temperature? And the answer is take a piece of paper and hold it up against the sun. Okay, you block the light from the sun. But the piece of paper, if you take the weight of the atmosphere compared to the piece of paper, the weight of the atmosphere is maybe a hundred thousand times the uh, the, 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 the the amount of material in this in this piece of paper. But the piece of paper can effectively block out the sun. So small things can have big impacts. Anyway, things like that that I think are interesting, hopefully will cause people to think for themselves about this. Do we know enough things about the, the sun to say that it is not involved in the changes observed? Because it's oftentimes the argument of the climate sceptics. And the answer is yes. It turns out we know, and, and life is, exists on the earth only because the sun is very quiescent if you wish it's not actually not if you're not near this if you're near the sun it's not very quiescent but what's amazing and remarkable and as an astrophysicist uh, I, i'm constantly amazed the fact that the sun in spite of the fact that there are billions of hydrogen bombs going off essentially every second in the core of the sun it, its luminosity is roughly constant now we can very we can measure, and the other thing is we can forget the models we can measure the luminosity of the sun we can do it very carefully and there are and of course there's solar cycles we can measure we can ask, given those measurements, what's the physical impact that we can have on Earth? These aren't, aren't unknowns. We just go out and observe the sun for 50 years, and we can, we can say, well, what we're seeing now is not, cannot be due to any variation that happened in the sun because the variations didn't happen. This isn't happening it literally. It's not, it's not magic. It's just observation. That and the fact that, that the sun itself is not, if you ask if there's any astronomical impacts on the climate of the Earth? The answer is yes, mm -hmm. but it's not so much the sun's activity, although its its generation of cosmic rays can have an impact. It's the it's the motion of the Earth and the other planets around it. The, the solar system has a small chaotic component. So the Earth's orbit does evolve over periods of time. They're called Milankovitch cycles. And that does affect the climate, but that's on a much larger, longer time scale than we're seeing now. And so the, 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 the time scales of the thing of the measurements we're making now, those changes on the order of decades are 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 small compared to the cosmic or astrophysical evolution of systems on Earth. It's true that in two billion years the sun will be fifteen percent brighter. At that point the Earth will undergo a massive greenhouse effect and be like Venus. But that's two billion years. Hmm. And um and um, yeah, exactly. It reminds me of, I've often say the only physics joke I know of, someone like me talks to you and says, in two billion years, this will happen. And the person comes back and says, did you say two million years? And the, and the scientist like me says, no, two billion years. Oh. And the person in the audience goes, who? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, uh, dear Lawrence France, who is the audience of, of, of this book? Uh, A qui est adressé ce livre? Okay, well, it's, it, it's it, obviously, the, the simple answer is everyone. Because we're all part of the, 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 we are all part of the problem. We all need to be part of the solution. But we all are going to. It's relevant to everyone. But really, it's relevant for anyone who's asked the questions: What should I believe, and what shouldn't I believe, and what, what's likely to happen? And so, therefore, the real audience are, are, are the public who are going to vote for politicians who are going to act. And the, and it's also there for the politicians and the and the policymakers because. They don't have to take things on faith. I hate the, uh, going mm. back to a discussion we had a, a, another time that that I uh, nothing should be taken on faith. We should always ask questions. And here is saying if people say I don't want to take claims of science, climate scientists on faith, this is your book because you can say, well, let me explore the science and see what I, what I what I whether I believe it or not. In fact, one of the people who wrote on the back of the English version of my book is a friend of mine, a very famous magician called. Penn Gillette, part of a uh, 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 Penn and Teller, our, mm -hmm. our magicians, and Penn wrote that this is the book he's always wanted because he never wanted. He, he hates when scientists tell him what to think, 
he doesn't know what he should believe. And so this for him was incredibly useful because it allowed him to decide what to, what, what to believe and what not to believe on his own. Okay, so let's explore the science. Thank you very much, uh, Lester Krauss, for your, for your time, for your work, for your dedication to all of this. We interviewed Richard Dawkins a few months ago, uh, and so uh, you are my heroes. So thank you very much. Oh, oh, thank you. Well, you know, I think um, I appreciate that. But I think I think uh, let me just say that by doing the work you're doing, you're being a hero, too. Okay. And um, and and in fact, to use the words of my atheist friend, Steven Weinberg, again, I can happily say you're doing God's work. <laughs> <laughs> Let's finish on that. Thank you very much.